go over these slides real quick, then we're going to talk about genetics. So this is the last time where we mentioned that the, the system is, is frozen, so we uh, did not go over these slides, so we want to go real quick. Um, this is how we categorize. Uh, can you please just stop talking there and we can talk later. Uh, nutritional types of organisms uh, based on the carbon source, energy source, electron source, we could categorize them autotrophs, heterotrophs. And the mo most of the bacteria we talk about so far is heterotrophs because they use reduced, preformed and organic molecules. And the energy resources, of course, there is an oxidation, organic or, or inorganic compounds. And the electron source, organic molecules. Now, other than that, you will see there's the autotrophs. Those are usually environmental bacteria. They are using carbon dioxide as an energy resource to do the biofuel And some of them using light to get electron. Let's say cyanobacteria. And some of them are in organic molecules could use sulfate, reduced to sulfide. So those are the examples. Then this becomes more complicated. If you combine everything, the one bacteria based on the carbon source, energy source, electron source could be more longer name to see, much longer name for these uh, nutrition type. And the, the bacteria what we have so far is chemo organo heterotrophs. So carbon source, organic carbon, energy source, uh, organic chemicals, electron source, organic electron donor, and disease, we talk about most of pathogens, fungi, protozoa, archaea, all these is chemo organo heterotrophs. Okay? Sulfur bacteria right here is going to be chemo liso heterotroph or chemo liso autotroph, it depends. And the cyanobacteria I just mentioned, it's photo liso autotrophs. Okay, so these are just the examples. Then we talk about already aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, fermentation. This is what I already talked about. That's electron based on the final electron acceptor. If it's oxygen, aerobic respiration. If it's other inorganic chemicals, then anaerobic respiration. Okay? And then we talk about the difference between substrate level phosphorylation and the oxidative phosphorylation. And what is proton molecule force? We already mentioned. And this is the fermentation. I draw on the blackboard. And uh, remember, the fermentation generates two ATPs, which is coupled with glycolysis. This is well picture, very good picture, tells you, well explained. <coughs> so you can see NADH reduced to NAD, oxidized to NAD, sorry. You see NAD is a recycled electron acceptor. Then they go back to the middle of the glycolysis cycle, then reduced to NADH2. And this become again and again, and then they generate two ATPs at the end of the day, substrate level phosphorylation. So this figure tells you why fermentation and the glycolysis are coupled. This is an example of what fermentation is going to be applied in the food industry or as a chemical industry. So probionic bacteria generate Swiss cheese. And you see those holes there, that is carbon dioxide. And you see the acid taste, that's probionic <coughs> acid. Lactic acid, you know lactobacillus, aspergillus, will become cheese, soy sauce, yogurt. Saccharomyces, remember this is the first time in the lab we did use a made the microscope. So carbon dioxide comes out, ethanol, wine, beer. Cross tritium, this is what I mentioned, the acetone. You can buy a bottle, nail remover, polish remover from Alta or Sephora. Where it comes from, cross trillion fermentation. And acidic acids, 5% acidic acid is a vinegar. Where they come from? E. coli. This is E. coli 1937 and the acidobacter. Okay, so this is the application of the fermentation. Then we talk about TCA cycle, electron transport chain, and the Abdomeyer Hoff pathway. 
six carbon, three carbon. So we talk about the, all the details right here. And the electron transport chain, chemosmosis. Basically, based on the electron transport chain, the proton repelled outside of the cell membrane system, become a potential energy called the proton motor force. Then they will be activated ATP synthesis, and then ADP with phosphate become ATP. Then, because more of the protons outside of the cell membrane, so they're going to be flow back and coupled with rotation of the bacterial flagella. So this is called hemosmosis. And this is a big picture, tells you how that works. And then we talk about aerobic oxidation of pyrobic acids, TCA cycle. And, uh, and I already drawn a picture in the lab section. It's on the blackboard, and I'll videotape the 20 minutes and we talk in the morning. So I'm going to upload onto the eCampus real quick. You can go back to see the video. The so lab, two labs, three labs, four, we will go over it real quick. Then we move on to today's lab. Okay? And this is a calculation of Arabic respiration, ATP. And this is another picture showing you how the Arabic respiration comes out. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to ask one student to do on Thursday. Is that okay? So you still have some time to prepare. <coughs> now, this is something we haven't talked about, but we want to briefly mention. We talk about aerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration, which means the final electron acceptor is not oxygen, other chemicals. Could be nitrites, sulfites, carbon dioxide, ferric acids, uh, fumarate even. Now, I want to mention they still generate a bunch of ATPs compared to the fermentation. It's much larger. However, they are going to be much less than aerobic respiration because the distance between the electron donor and the electron acceptor will be smaller than the aerobic respiration. Can you see it? Generally yields less energy because easier of electron acceptor is less positive than electron of the, the value of the oxygen. So that's why it is less energy generated going through aerobic respiration. And this is an important table, which is almost computer everything. The past we used the terminal electron acceptor, and how many going through substrate level phosphorylation, and what is the ATP generated by oxidative phosphorylation, what is the total ATP generated? So this is very important. And this table, I could even ask you to fill some of them during the exam. So I may ask you to do aerobic respiration and fermentation. We don't talk about the anaerobic respiration too much. So we may ask you to fill the table. Okay, so that table is important. The last one, I just want to be briefly mentioned. This is another one, which is called a fentose phosphate. And this is uh, related to the five carbon sugar of come out, which is a precursor of DNA and RNA. So we just briefly mentioned here, you can see the pathway here, but what is the conclusion? Primary responsible for generating five carbon sugar, synthesis RNA, DNA. So reducing power here is not NADH, is NADPH. So basically, these precursor metabolites is used to, for biosynthesis, DNA and RNA. That is actually anabolism. But I'll just be very briefly mention this one, because this is not that important regarding the, um, the bacteria. So we just uh, briefly mention, and you need to know, the reducing power here for biosynthesis is NADPH instead of NADH. Okay, so this is where we get the conclusion of what we have. And I also have a Zoom video slides talk about like 15 minutes. So I will be uploaded onto the eCampus in the afternoon so you can read that. Okay, so we're gonna move on to today's session, which is gonna talk about is DNA and uh, uh, replication, transcription, translation, we wanna talk about that. Okay, I'm still gonna draw a lot of things on the blackboard, so we can talk. Um, we finished the biochemistry section of the examination three. We're going to move on to is a genetic part. The genetic part is pretty like very basic. 
Uh, but I want to go over these things to make sure you understand. So what is going to be the outline of our uh, of this section? The very simple. Do you know DNA will be become RNA and then become protein? Okay, so what is this one called? Transcription. DNA can transcription become RNA. And RNA can go into translation, become protein. And the DNA can also do a replication by itself. And this whole thing, we have a terminology for that. And um, you should tell me in five seconds, called central dogma. Okay, I want to make sure the central dog dogma is 90.58 by Frank. Um, let me just double check. I just searched the one. I, I forgot a little bit. By Francisco Quick. by Francisco Crick. At the beginning, when he talked about the central dogma, he did not say this. What he said is nuclear acids become protein. He didn't say that, the whole thing. So more research doing, we know the replication, transcription, and translation. So at the beginning, it's only nuclear gases become protein. That's one of his original version. Um, I also want to mention, more research from doing after 1970s, 1980s, people say the central dogma is wrong. Why? Right now you know, this guy called go back, called reverse transcription. So some people say it's wrong, but not, not really. It's still uh, outline of today's genetic area and the biochemistry area. So this is going to be our basic outline for this section. We talk about DNA replication, RNA transcription, RNA translation become a protein, and we also talk a little bit about regulation. For example, we will mention lactose offer. Okay. So this is basically our outline for this session. So next, we want to talk about something, a little bit of history. I want to go over this history because it's very important. Something related to even today. We talk about DNA, RNA, nuclear gases. This is a genetic information. So in the history, people spending a lot of time, almost about 23 years uh, timeline, to find the genetic information. So the first thing what happened is 1928, the F. Griffin. He did a very interesting study, which is a streptococcusomonia. to see the rough or smooth streptococcusomonia when they inject it into the mice to see the mice died or still survive, they need to see the genetic information. So this research basically is to talk about genetic information. And at this stage, they don't know it's on or the image yet. So what happened? Why griefing will think about to using streptococcus ammonia? Today we talk about COVID-19. It's already been two years, almost. Back in 1910s, there is an almost 110 years ago, there is another pandemic, global pandemic. If you know, we mentioned this day, Spanish flu. This is lasted about six years. 
So Reuben at the time, he's a British scientist, want to find that the vaccine could be combat this bacteria. So he did some of the research. He found there is a two type of the Streptococcus ammonia. Number one is we call it smooth. Okay, let's say we have it smooth. One. Number two, different type of the ammonia, which is a rough one. And the smooth one, which is virulent. Which means if you inject it into the human being or animal, the people or human animal will be died at the time. The rough one will still survive. So this is non virulent. And today we know, uh, we already talked about the exam two, streptococcus ammonia. This guy is capsule. Is that right? This is non-capsule. Because a capsule could let the streptococcus ammonia invade into the uh, villa area and cause ammonia. That's a major thing. And of course, you know, this is diprococci. Okay, what's the research they did? First of all, this is a smooth ammonia. Go into a rat. The rat is dead. And he isolated Streptococcus ammonia. from rats, from the dead rats. Okay, then what he did? He used a rough one. This is injection, okay? The rough one is also injection go to rats. The rats is survived. Then what he did? He used a smooth one. But this smooth one, he hit it. So he injured. When you hit injured, what's going to happen? The capsule may be gone. Okay, what we call it a morphology or the phenotype is gone, but the genotype is still there. Okay, let's say something important right here is still there. Then he combined it with a rock. Ammonia. And then they combine them, go into a rat, and the rat is still there. Now, what happened? You know, this guy has been transferred. Here. Or, there are some miserable about this one. So, people know this is a genetic. Information. They don't know what is that. Okay? They already know this is genetic information. However, now of course when he did this, he had another control group, which is you had a smooth, you heat it. Is that right? So you go to a rat, then the rat is survived. Okay, this is like a control. I will say it's a control. Negative control, this is like a positive control. The second one is a positive control. Okay, this is tells us there's some genetic information, some magic stuff. Unfortunately, Griffin was died during Second World War because of the German bombing. Very unfortunate. A very smart young scientist. So the work stopped from here. We don't know what type of the genetic information it is. So, more people are going to do something. Is that right? This is the thing you work with. Then, 
This research did 90 years. He was died during Second World War, around like 1941, probably. Okay. 1943. There is a group of scientists in the United States. Avery McCarthy and McLeod. They are in Rockefeller Medical Center in New York City. This group of scientists did another research which is verified. This genetic information is DNA. Okay, how they did that? Right there on the slides, it tells you how they did that. I need some space so I draw this one. They grab a tube. This tube is, has a rough streptococcus ammonia. Okay. Then they grow them onto other plates to see whether there is something happens. If you want to use rough ammonia, there is no DNA comes out. There is no transfer. So what they do? In the second set of the research, they are using an R, and they combine it with a S smooth streptococcus ammonia using the extract. OK, then they pour them on the other media. What they find? The DNA is there, which means the transfer happens. The smooth extract has the DNA, they could be transferred. Okay, then they want to verify this DNA. They want to verify this DNA. They need to kick out the possibility of it is could be RNA or could be a protein. They did kick out the possibility, other possibilities. But what he did? Is another set, which is all with smooth <coughs> extract, but they are adding D nase. This is DNA nase, which means can hydrolyze DNA. Okay, what happened when they put on the agar? There is no DNA, no transfer. Then they did two more stuff. This is the add all with smooth extract. They're using all this. What it is all this? Hydrolyze or destroy oiling it. Then they put on this agar. There is DNA and there is a transfer happens. The last one what they did. They use the R and smooth and the smooth extract. They so using proteins. Remember in the lab we did the casings. That's a proteus. What happened? What 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 happened here? There is a DNA, and there is a transfer happens, but there is no RNA, and this is no protein right. So what does this message tell us? This tells this DNA is the genetic information. And this way to transfer DNA, today we know it is one of the methods to transfer bacteria genetic information, which is called transformation. We have a terminology for it. Okay? So this is 90 for this week. Okay, then later on, not done yet. People are going to be 
still doing something. Okay, they work really hard. In 1952, Hershey Chase, a two scientist, did another experiment to verify the genetic information is also DNA, but from another standpoint. This is Greg Hershey at the Master Chase. This is not a candy ball, a chocolate candy ball from the Lancaster County of Pennsylvania, okay. He was a scientist in the uh, Washington St. Louis, Washington University of St. Louis. Um, got a Nobel Prize later on, 1967. Massa Chase doesn't do very well later, just to become a general common researcher, not very famous later on, okay. He suffered, she suffered from some disease and died with ammonia in 1975, about like 70, 75 years old. So what is this research for? This is the one they, from transformation standpoint, know this genetic information is DNA. They are actually from transaction standpoint to verify the DNA is genetic information. Okay, how they did that? You need to know there is a bacteria there. There are some of the virus could attacking a bacteria that could call bacteria fudge. Okay, there's something like this. This is called T2 bacteria fudge. And you should know the bacteria fudge most of the time is all in it. Bacteria fudge is a virus. Virus the genome either all in it or DNA, never goes. But this T2 bacteria fudge, the genome is DNA. And what is the basic structure? Very, very simple. That's why virus is difficult to control. This is DNA or nuclear gases. Outside is protein. We call it a capsid. We'll talk about later on when we go to the virus. Okay, when you attaching a bacteria, the color be called a burst or lysis of the bacteria. Or sometimes the genome could be integrated into the bacterial chromosome. So what happened? This guy could go here. Okay, since there is a two parts 